Just about every astrophotographer I've heard of, including myself, started their interest in astronomy the same way. The moon or the planets. Seeing these things with our own eyes was inspirational, and I think we can all remember how we felt when we saw Saturn's rings for the first time. Seeing these things left us with a thirst for more, but it also left us with a question as to how do you even get started into astrophotography in the first place? Well, simply put, time and experience are the best teachers. But in this video, we're going to cover the majority of the basic steps that you need to take in order to get started in astrophotography, as well as some of the basic equipment that you're going to need in order to take your first astro images. Also, we're going to go over some good deep sky objects that you can start off imaging. There is an overwhelming amount of equipment on the internet today designed for astrophotography. And if you're just getting started, you may get confused or frustrated because there's just so many options. And honestly, when you take a look at the specifications for this equipment, you might have no idea what you're looking at. Let's combine all of these different kinds of equipment into three different setups. The first of these is the most affordable of these setups. It consists of nothing more than a sky tracker and a DSLR camera and lens. The second of these setups is a deep sky setup. Now, this setup is slightly more expensive, but with this setup you can also get more detail than you would with the first setup. This setup consists of a larger mount, generally go-to that can easily locate deep sky objects in the night sky, and this setup usually uses a larger lens or telescope. This lens or telescope has a medium to large focal length, allowing you to get a sufficient amount of detail on your favorite deep sky object. The last of these setups is definitely more of a pricey setup. This requires a heavy duty mount, able to handle the weight of a large high focal length telescope capable of even getting great detail on planets. Assuming that you're new to astrophotography, the first setup would be the best start to your astrophotography journey. As mentioned before, this setup contains nothing more than a DSLR camera and a sky tracker. The sky tracker mount, like all astrophotography mounts, rotates around Earth's celestial pole, keeping the deep sky object centered in the field of view of your camera with the moving sky. My first image with this setup was definitely a learning experience for me. I used a Skywatcher Star Adventure 2i paired with a Canon Rebel T7 and a 75-300mm kit lens. And although my results aren't nearly as good as my pictures now, it was still really exciting getting one step closer to professional deep sky imaging. This first setup is definitely something I would consider as a prerequisite for if you want to start astrophotography for two different reasons. Not only does it push you to learn the basics of astrophotography, but it also forces you to learn the night sky by heart. Having this basic knowledge will add more passion to the experience. And by the way, if you're interested in learning more tips and tricks to better your astrophotography, consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel. If you plan on using a sky tracker, you need to make sure your camera is properly balanced. This will allow you to take longer exposures, generally ranging between one and three minutes, depending on how well you have it polar aligned and balanced. And speaking of polar alignment, you're gonna wanna make sure you have that as spot on as possible. This is made fairly easy because most sky trackers have built-in markings inside of the polar scopes. And when you check where Polaris is supposed to be centered based on those markings, you can usually get it right the first time. The reason polar alignment is so important is that if you don't polar align, eventually you'll get streaky stars and the deep sky object that you had located will slowly drift out of the field of view of your camera. With these star trackers, you can either use a DSLR with a lens or a DSLR paired with an extremely lightweight telescope. Lenses are usually better for wide-angle astrophotography shots of things like the Milky Way galaxy or larger regions of the night sky such as the Orion Loop, whereas lightweight telescopes are better for more detail of smaller deep sky objects while staying within a budget. In fact, one of my early shots of the Orion Nebula were taken with a lightweight refractor paired with a Skywatcher Star Adventure 2i. This was kind of tricky because I had to use a classic red dot finder to locate this deep sky object in the night sky rather than using an automatic go-to mount. Some basics to the settings for DSLR astrophotography might surprise you. A mistake that many beginners make is the idea that in order to get a better picture, and by the way, this goes for both DSLR cameras and astro cameras, you need to use a high ISO or gain. The only time this is true is when you're trying to get exposures of 30 seconds or less and are gonna be taking lots and lots of exposures. What you should focus on instead is using a lower gain around 400 to 800 ISO if you're using a DSLR, and gain 100 if you're using a dedicated astro-cooled camera. Also, you need to take plenty of long exposures between one to three minutes, depending on what your mount is able to handle. Also, you need to make sure that your mount is able to dither. But what is that? 
Dithering is a slight shifting of where your camera field of view is centered between each frame you take. The purpose of this is to avoid something called walking noise. Walking noise is streaks of light caused by stacking your light frames that contain hot pixels. This is more common in DSLR cameras and uncooled astronomy cameras, and it can be very difficult to edit out. If you're using a DSLR for your astrophotography, you should consider buying a little tool known as an intervalometer. An intervalometer actually activates the shutter of your camera for a certain amount of time, and you can choose how many times you want it to activate. That way, you can set up your camera and your mount and leave it outside for you to go get some rest. If you plan on getting a larger telescope, you're going to need a mount that can handle the weight. This pretty much pushes all sky trackers out of the picture and requires you to purchase a go-to mount. Obviously, this is not a bad thing. Go-to mounts make everything in astrophotography easier and is easily controlled on your laptop via programs like SharpCap or Nina, or you can purchase an onboard controller like the ZWO ASI Air, which allows you to control your camera, mount, guide scope, everything, all from your phone. When choosing your telescope or DSLR lens, there's two factors that you're going to need to keep in mind. Aperture, which is the diameter of the lens or the telescope, and focal length, which is the length of the lens or the telescope. Aperture affects how quickly light is able to be collected by your telescope camera. The wider the lens, the faster light can be collected, allowing for shorter exposures with the same amount of light reaching the camera. Focal length affects the magnification of your lens or telescope. If you have a short focal length, somewhere between 50 millimeters and 300 millimeters, you'll likely be getting more wide angle shots rather than up close and personal shots of things like galaxies and nebula. If you have a focal length between 300 and 600 millimeters, you'll be able to get a good amount of detail out of most of the deep sky objects that you're imaging. Anything beyond 600 millimeters would be suitable for incredible, highly detailed images of galaxies and planets, but they definitely would require a good, sturdy mount that can handle the weight. If you're shopping for a telescope, make sure you don't just go with whatever telescope you see first. Make sure you do proper research on whatever it is that you'd like to image, whether it be galaxies, planets, or nebula, and choose a telescope based on that. After all, unfortunately, there's no such thing as a telescope that works great for all kinds of deep sky objects. And when you're choosing a mount, make sure that you check the weight limit that mount can handle. And don't push the weight limit by even the slightest, because this can cause gradual wear and tear on your mount. When getting started in astrophotography, you might see some cool pictures taken by Hubble of super bright galaxies and nebula, but the truth behind those pictures is that they're not actually as bright as they seem when you go to image it, and it can be extremely difficult to process as a beginner. Rather than trying to focus on imaging darker abstract objects that admittedly are really cool, although you might not want to, you should probably focus on trying to image the larger, brighter, more common deep sky objects. This will give you an easier time when you're trying to practice processing on your PC for the first time. Throughout the months of October through February, try imaging Andromeda, Orion, the Rosette Nebula, and the Horsehead Nebula. These are some great easy to process targets from the winter sky. From the months of March through June, try imaging Bode's Galaxy, the Ring Nebula, and the Hercules Star Cluster. From July back to October, you can try imaging the Whirlpool Galaxy, the North American Nebula, and the Veil Nebula. A free program, if you don't want to spend an extra $100 on processing, is called Cyril. There are lots of tutorials that are extremely helpful on YouTube to help you process your deep sky images. And as we all know, astrophotography heavily relies on stacking your light frames. Most astroprocessing software requires that you either shoot in a RAW format, if you're using a DSLR camera, or FITS format, when using an astro camera. Then you can take these files into programs such as Serial or Deep Sky Stacker in order for you to get started. In order for you to stack and properly calibrate your light frames, you're also going to need dark frames, bias frames, and flat frames. Dark frames can take up a lot of time, and thankfully they're not necessary if you're using a cooled camera. However, if you're using an uncooled camera, you're going to need to make sure that you first cover your lens so that no light can reach your camera sensor. And leaving all of the settings the same as your lights files, you're going to want to take at least 20 frames. These frames are important in uncooled cameras because they eliminate any remaining hot pixels and they can clean up some noise from your image. And the reason that these are so tricky to take is that these frames need to be taken at the same temperature as your light files. As a recommendation, try to take your darks files either right before your astro imaging session or directly after. Otherwise, the temperatures might not match up and the noise pattern would be different. Bias frames are thankfully way easier to take. 
In order to take bias frames, leave your lens covered just like you would in dark frames, set your exposure speed to the shortest exposure your camera is capable of, and leave everything else the same. You want to take as many of these frames as possible. Personally, I take 200 since they're so fast, but I could do more. The purpose of bias frames is to eliminate readout noise and to get rid of any dark fixed pattern noise caused by manufacturing issues. These patterns are found in every camera, and even if you might not see it initially in your stacked frame, you'll see it once you stretch your image. Flat frames are also slightly tricky. For these frames, you need a flat light source placed on top of your telescope or camera lens. You can use a light panel, a white backlit sheet, or even a laptop screen. The focus has to be the exact same focus as the focus in your light frames. And you need to make sure that your histogram peaks about three quarters of the way to the right. To get the right exposure time for your DSLR, simply set your DSLR camera to AV mode. And it should automatically set the needed exposure time for your flat frames. Also, make sure that you keep your ISO or gain the same as your light frames. Flat frames are used to correct any vignetting or dust spots that are found in your light frames. There are a lot more steps to take in astrophotography, but this video contains some of the most basic steps you need to get started. Don't expect to get everything perfect the first time. It's not going to happen. Astrophotography is a continuous learning experience, even for those who have more advanced knowledge in the hobby. As technology changes, the night sky changes as well, and all of us will continue to roll with it. Hopefully you found this video helpful, and I hope you enjoyed the video, and hopefully I'll see you again soon. Clear skies, everyone.